Hey guys, Gelly Baba here. I've been a rank 1 player since 2014, mainly playing Mage and Warlock. I've competed in several tournaments throughout the years, and I won against some of the best players the game has ever had to offer, both from the comfort of my bedroom through to the intense pressure of the stages at LAN. However, despite my wins and good performances, it's always the grueling defeats of these players that really made me reflect and improve on my own gameplay. So to help you along your own journey, I've compiled the top 3 things I've learned over the years that I really wish I knew earlier. One of the major lessons I've learned over the years revolves around crowd control, and the fact that it should be your damage that dictates when you crowd control, rather than your crowd control dictating when you do damage. When I got rank 1 for the first time in Mr. Pandaria, and begun playing competitively in Walls of Draenor, setups were king. You would play around your deep freeze as a mage and win or lose on how well you would execute your goes as a team, regardless of what composition you played. Throughout the Walls of Draenor, Fezia, Miley, Valet and I were regarded as one of the best RMDs and Shatters, as our synchronized CCs and setups allowed us to dominate the ladder in tournaments, earning us a spot at the 2015 and 2016 lands. Unfortunately, like the majority of European teams in 2015, we were disqualified, and as we returned to LAN in 2016, Blizzard made the tournament play on the Legion patch, rather than the Walls of Draenor one we qualified on, ushering in a new way to play the game in the process, where raw damage was now far more effective than control. At the time, I didn't know this, and as we went in to play our games that made Shadow Priest Holy Paladin, I played how I thought the game should be played. I landed the great crowd controls, I hit kicks, and I bursted with huge glacial spikes. However, we ended up getting crushed by Botar's melee cleave, as they easily traded cooldowns over and over until we died to Vendetta or Wings. A few series went by, and then it was Raikou's turn to face Botar's team. And with a matchup very similar to ours, they won. But their games looked completely different. Instead of forcing crowd control on DR as I was doing, Raikou was spamming damage first and using crowd control when the enemy team was already low. This put far more strain on Botar to heal and made Raikou's crowd control far more effective, as the enemy team was already low going into the setups meaning every CC chain turned into a life or death scenario. In turn, Botar was also not able to play as offensive into them as his team was constantly under pressure, and he wasn't on diminishing return, so he couldn't just walk through the map for crowd controls of his own, he had to play far more cautious. Finally, Raikou's team also ended up taking less damage, because the enemy team had to keep running away or risk just dying to Raikou spamming Frostbolts. This strategy was eye-opening to me. Much like many Rogue Mage players at the time, I believe that no matter how little damage you did, if your setups were clean, it was irrelevant. I really wish I could go back in time and tell myself how dumb that was. Since then, I've always made sure to deal as much damage as possible before initiating a setup or committing my mobility to land CC, even going as far as to learning to PvE better on the classes I play to maximize the output I can do. By implementing this strategy, I also realized some of the other benefits though, as it made creating setups far easier too, as the enemy teams wouldn't be able to just smash damage into me as I went for CCs as they were already under pressure. Just think of how many games you've played on a caster, where you've pushed in for that crowd control just to get demolished by incoming damage. Since learning this lesson, I don't usually have that problem anymore. And for those of you who want to fast track this learning process, you'll definitely want to check out Skill Camp's damage guides, which are available for every spec over on their site. Moving on, the second lesson I wish I had learned earlier is learning to position well. This is also a huge factor in improving my gameplay, as it not only helps you live longer, but also allows you to create win conditions without much effort. Your ideal positioning changes depending on what composition you're facing. So first, let's go over how to stand against teams with one or more melee. If you've seen our easiest way to beat every melee DPS video, you'll know that the value a melee player gets increases based on how many targets they can connect to at any given time. Therefore, our job as a range player is to minimize the amount of effectiveness the enemy melee player can generate through our positioning, as after all, our abilities have a longer range than theirs. To do this, we really have to make sure we are aware of our teammates positioning at all times, regardless of if we're the target of the enemy team or not, and try to maintain as much distance from them as possible. This is very important, as if we waddle into our teammate, we not only allow the enemy melee the chance to deal damage to two targets for free, but also give them the opportunity to interrupt high priority cards from two players. Or even worse than that, it can allow them to create a huge setup with a double stun, which could easily have been avoided with a little more situational awareness. Instead, what we should be doing is attempting to maintain distance from our partners at all times, so the melee can only interact with one target making it a huge pain for them to swap or get value from any of their cleave or utility abilities. Along with maintaining distance from our teammates, when we face melees, you should also look to drag them as far away from their healer as possible, while dealing damage or crowd controlling them. By doing this, you force the enemy healer off of their pillar while they try to dispel or heal their teammate, leaving them vulnerable to crowd control or swaps. While doing this, you can also abuse pillars yourself to crowd control the melees behind them, meaning they won't be able to be dispelled. I love doing this to over-eager melees that chase me by rooting them behind a wall of my mage. 
In contrast, if you were to just try and play on top of the enemy healer while you had a melee sitting on you, it would easily avoid all of your CC as they have their all-important pillar to line of sight on, and you're never going to get to them while you're snared by that melee player. You're also going to end up doing far less damage and taking more damage as you crowd control on the enemy melee, but be much easier to dispel, and they have far more uptime than they should. By dragging the melee away with a defensive play, we can actually create offensive opportunities. Moving on, let's talk about double caster mirrors, where the concept of dragging them back while being good at some points in the match can also backfire incredibly fast. If the enemy team are playing a composition with spammable crowd control, like a boomkin or warlock, pulling back can be devastating as you're all going to be in the effective range of their crowd controls. While stacking on the pillar with your teammates may seem like a good positioning at the time, you can quickly go south as the enemy team overwhelms you with damage and CC from each side of the pillar. To avoid these situations, you need to use the map to your advantage and cross it as frequently as possible with your team. As you all cross the map, you not only avoid the crowd control of the enemy team, but also allow your team to PvE them down as they cross the map to get back on top of you, all the while leaving their healer open for crowd control or setups of your own. Finally, let's talk about those miserable times where you're playing with a melee and facing a double caster team. The amount of complaining from your melee being CC'd is always off the charts. Now while you may think that pillaring 40 yards away against these compositions is the way to go as you duck in and out of the enemy's cast avoiding damage, this isn't the only thing you should be worrying about. Sure, it's not bad at points to recover during the game, however in the long run, if it's all you're going to do, the wizard team will always win unless they make a mistake. This is because they're going to be able to do whatever they want with your melee player, whether it be damage or CC, and by positioning so far away from the fight, you're forcing your healer into a tough spot where they're trying to heal two targets that are very far apart from each other, leaving them very vulnerable to damage or CC on themselves. Standing this far also means your melee can't push in past a certain point, causing your team to lose pressure because of your positioning. Instead, what you should be doing is not playing to avoid damage, but instead to enable your melee player. This means pushing into the closest pillar available, or even being out in the open, allowing your healer to also push up, freeing your melee in the process. By maintaining this aggressive positioning, you allow yourself the ability to peel for your melee instantly, as well as giving them the freedom to push on top of the enemy team without the fear of being crowd controlled for the next 20 seconds. You're going to win far more games with this aggressive mindset, rather than dampening yourself into a loss by sitting in the back. Positioning is covered far more extensively in skill cap positioning courses, so you'll definitely want to check those out too. My final point on improving is all about pressuring healers, as after all, they are the cornerstone of every arena team, be it 2v2, 3v3 or solo shuffle. Now a lot of us, myself included for a long time, always saw healers as a target to crowd control and nothing else. After all, if they're stuck in CC, they can't heal, right? Well, if you've ever taken the time to play a heal your little yourself, you know this couldn't be more wrong. Regardless of what class you're playing, hitting the healer is in fact a great crowd control in itself, as the more pressure they are under, the less they are able to do offensively. This is huge for your team, as it means the enemy is far less disruptive, and you can have a lot more freedom for DPS in the match, without having to worry about the enemy healer's utility. Not only do you prevent the healer going in by hitting them though, but into certain classes that benefit highly from mastery, like Restoration Druids and Shamans, you deny a huge portion of their healing by removing their embellishment. Removing Zone of Focus is a play you should always be looking to do if you notice it's up, as it gives them a huge mastery bonus while they're above 90% health, making it far harder for you to outpressure their healing with damage. If you ever see this buff on the enemy healer, make sure you target them as much as possible to get it off, and watch their healing reduce tenfold in the process. Moving on, another great way to pressure healers is through your positioning, if you're not the focus target for the other team that is. By standing close to the enemy healer, you can ensure you're always in position to capitalize off any pressure your team has created instantly. Instead of seeing an enemy is low and then crossing the war zone in the middle of the map for a CC, you can play on top of the healer and instantly shove them into an initiation crowd control, like Mortal Coil or Dragon's Breath, allowing you to follow up with a longer casted CC afterwards. This change of positioning denies the healer topping their team before you reach them to crowd control them and it helps prevent the other team from shutting you down, making your setup as powerful and likely to land. It doesn't just go for class of hard CCs though, as even if you're an elemental shaman you can still utilize this aggressive healer positioning to deny healing with your knocks and roots, you just need to get a little bit more creative with what you consider a crowd control. Speaking of elemental shamans, they tie in great with my final point on pressuring healers. If you're a dot class, you should always prioritize dotting the healer when you can. This is a lesson I learned a long time ago from Wallerick's Affliction video on Skullcat back in MOP, and it still holds true to this day. And it's really obvious when you think about it, as the healer is not always in your line of sight, so you should of course look to dot them whenever they're in range, regardless of how much it will mess with your pandemic timers. You never know when you're going to have that opportunity again. Not only does this allow you to maintain dots better on healers through more button presses, but it's also more likely your dots are going to stick on the healer than the DPS in general. 
This is due to healers often prioritizing dispelling their DPS to reduce pressure and move CCs, so any dots you use on the healer are likely going to be there for much longer than the ones you apply to the DPS. So learn from my mistakes and make sure you dot that healer. As a reminder, don't forget to check out skill caps after this using the discount link in the description. There you can find thousands of arena commentaries made by myself and other rank 1 and tournament veterans. We've also got class guides for every spec that guide you through the basics of a rotation, defensive play and crowd control, into more advanced tips that players like myself use every day. In addition to hundreds of hours of content that Skillcats has curated to guide any player in their journey, no matter their level. Skillcat members can also gain direct contact to myself and other pros in Ask a Pro section of the Skillcat Discord server to have any of your PvP questions answered. And all of this comes with a 400 rating gain guarantee where you'll get your money back. Alright guys, that's it for this one. I hope this video helped you along your PvP journey. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.